Order. Joe Gideon to move the motion. to be speaking on the theme of volunteering this afternoon um, and with the absence of a large number of backbenchers um, it gives me the chance to opine at length on a subject close to my heart. Before I start I wanted to thank the Honourable Member for the City of Durham who kindly co-sponsored this debate with me. She sends her apologies that she cannot be here today due to health reasons but would like to recognise the enormous contribution of volunteers in County Durham and beyond who do so much for our communities. I would like to use this debate to do exactly the same. This may be my last opportunity to highlight the wonderful work of individuals and organisations from my constituency without the pressure of a tight time limit, so that I hope you, Ms Knox, and the Minister uh, will indulge me as I incorporate into the debate a love letter to the wonderful people it has been my privilege to work with in the great city of Stoke-on-Trent, including the 70-plus charities and community groups who share their wisdom and provide mutual support at my charity roundtable. In a city where many people struggle both financially and health-wise, I am humbled by the work of the many volunteers who step up to help those less fortunate and how those with little look after those with less. I do believe that the resilience of my local community stems from a strong sense of place and identity and decades of disappointment about a lack of investment after the decline of traditional industries that were the feature of the city, the steelworks, mining and the potteries. As the city sees a renaissance with the growth of new creative and digital sectors, transport and logistics, as well as new civil service jobs, there are still too many who struggle with the cost of living or with accessing services, and the help provided by volunteers is absolutely essential. Next month, charities across the UK will be celebrating the 40th anniversary of Volunteers Week. This is an annual campaign that starts on the first Monday of June every year. It's an opportunity for charities and the wider public to recognise, celebrate and thank the UK's incredible volunteers for all they contribute to our local communities the voluntary sector and society as a whole. I am grateful for the opportunity to have this debate in advance of Volunteers Week, as not only does it allow me to highlight the incredible achievements of our country as a result of volunteering, but also to act as a bit of a call to action, to encourage those who have got out of the habit of volunteering, or maybe never had the opportunity to, to look at their local community and consider how they might be able to help out and give their time. Volunteering is critical to a vibrant, flourishing and resilient civil society. It benefits volunteers and the organisations involving them and has transformational impacts on beneficiaries and their communities, delivering public services and building social cohesion. This support can be seen particularly clearly during specific crises such as the COVID-19 pandemic. But community support is not simply about helping people affected by the pandemic or its economic and social aftershocks. The contribution of volunteers extends much farther and deeper than unforeseen emergencies. Many people volunteer with sports clubs and youth groups, including scouts and guides and other uniformed youth groups, with their faith communities or their neighbourhoods. Others perform more specialised support, such as mentoring youth, working with prisoners or the homeless, or volunteering in a hospital or other health settings, such as, um, I mean, I, I think in, in my own um, patch, the, the work of volunteers for the local hospice is remarkable. Um, and Help Force, the charity providing volunteers in support of the NHS. There is a lack of robust data on the economic and wider social impact of volunteering. But it is worth noting, former Chief Economist at the Bank of England, Andy Haldane, value the contribution of volunteering to the UK economy each year as in excess of 50 billion, or 2.5% of GDP. Even this is likely to be an underestimate. If occasional and informal volunteering had been included as well, the figure would likely have been much <coughs> higher. Latest data from the National Council of Voluntary Organisations calculated that around 14.2 million people in the UK volunteered through a group, club or organisation 
with many more volunteering informally. Interestingly, it's people over 50 who are most likely to volunteer and provide unpaid care. According to the latest community life survey results, respondents aged 65 to 74 were most likely to participate in formal volunteering at least once a month compared to other age groups. This is alongside the contributions they make to the economy through work. It is hugely important that we recognise and value the impactful contributions that the many volunteers over state pension age make, bringing their wealth of skills and experience developed in the workplace. But benefits work both ways. Volunteering can have a transformational impact on the lives of older people themselves. Research has shown that older people who take part in volunteering report improved well-being, life satisfaction and lower rates of depression. Older people are incredibly positive towards charities. They do a great deal to support them, both through financial support and volunteering. However, there's a real appetite amongst many older people to want to do more. Many feel that they have a skill that they would like to use to help a charity, but don't know how to get involved. I feel strongly that more needs to be done to link older people up with volunteering opportunities, giving them the chance to access all the health and well-being uh, benefits linked directly to community action. And that's why I'm hosting an over 55 fair at Staffordshire University on May the 31st to offer advice and connect people. It's a core part of my Nothing But A Number Summit where we're looking at how to make Stoke-on-Trent an age-friendly city. The importance of volunteering will definitely be on the agenda. At the other end of the spectrum, social action has a dual benefit, particularly for young people. This is the positive impact for a chosen cause, as well as the personal skill gained from their experience. It helps improve students' motivation at school and is particularly powerful in developing soft skills that are more difficult to teach in the classroom, like leadership and teamwork. Research has discovered that young people are extremely socially minded and believe that individuals have a duty to make a positive social contribution. They are committed to causes and want to use their time to make an impact. But even though many young people want to make a difference, they too need information on how to get involved. People want to volunteer. But time and time again, I hear people not knowing how to make the first step, and that's the biggest barrier to volunteer recruitment. Despite the overall decline in volunteering, 62% of people who have not volunteered in the past three years said they could be encouraged to volunteer. There is a huge untapped potential and provides a key opportunity for government to support the sector in unlocking this goodwill. When speaking with the Scouts, they shared that people volunteer either because they have an existing connection to the Scouts or simply because they were asked to. We really shouldn't underestimate the power of simply asking people to volunteer. I run a local charity roundtable every month, and I heard a lovely story shared by the National Literacy Trust recently. One of their literary champions, Caroline, began her journey with them during the summer of 2022, where she supported some of the Trust's very busy Tales in the Park event. Since then, the whole family has got involved. They're always on hand to support the Literacy Trust work and run activities that benefit our community, including running literacy activities on Port Vale Match Days, a Halloween booktacular event outside their house where they gave out books as well as sweets, running a community bookcase outside their house and supporting at so many of our local literacy events. Within school, Caroline's son, Jaden, has run a Look for a Book trails for his class during Kindness Week supported with book donations for his school, and even runs a community bookcase, wheeling out his trolley of books every Friday afternoon for parents to choose and swap books. Starting as a reluctant reader, Jaden is so proud to be a liter literary ch literacy champion and keen to support his peers in any way he can. He just loves helping people. And this is just one example of how inspiring young people to volunteer can encourage them to invite friends and family to join in their voluntary activities. Jaden volunteers because he loves helping people. Research from the NCVO shows that people overwhelmingly volunteer because they want to make improvements to the communities they live in and help the people around them. When asked people why they volunteer, the most common motivation 
is simply the desire to make a difference. But people also gain a sense of achievement by volunteering. They make new friends, gain new skills, and improve their career prospects. Indeed, as well as the significant value to society, a recent report by the British Heart Foundation found that volunteering also has clear benefits to the individual and can play a key role in contributing the government's ambitions around increasing healthy life expectancy, levelling up and tackling loneliness. In particular, 94% of volunteers agree that volunteering had helped them feel less isolated or lonely. 92% agree that volunteering had helped their mental health. And 80% agree that it had helped their physical health. Volunteering can take many different forms across all settings in society. About one in five recent volunteers have volunteered for local community or neighbourhood groups, making it the most popular cause to volunteer for. This may be volunteering at food banks, hostels or helping the homeless. But there are also many services being delivered by volunteers that are deemed absolutely essential by the public. The Samaritans, St John's Ambulance, Citizens Advice, to name a few. For example, I was reading in the news recently that the boss of a uh, supermarket chain Iceland has said medics saved his life after he collapsed at Sunday, last Sunday's London Marathon. He was racing to save money for Alzheimer's Research UK and he became unconscious just a mile from the finish line. He said he came around with St John Ambulance volunteers piling ice on his chest in an attempt to bring his temperature down from a dangerously high 42 degrees. These volunteers make an extraordinary contribution to our society. They played a huge part in the successful rollout of vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic, and they continue to support communities through cost of living challenges. Volunteering also keeps our high streets alive and preserves the heritage of our towns. First consider charity shops. We know that high streets could be completely abandoned around the country without charity shops. Without people running things on high streets, we would lose the soul of our towns and cities across the country. Dougie Mac is a well-loved Stoke charity, and I'm sure we can all picture other charity shop fronts, Cancer Research, Salvation Army, Oxfam. Charities up and down the country are so grateful for volunteers that run their retail, without which the charities would cease to exist. The vast majority of their income has to be generated through commercial activities. Without volunteers, this would be impossible. We need to maintain this community input in keeping our high streets alive and recognise the roles volunteers play in that. And coming back to local heritage, I love visiting Etruria Industrial Museum in Stoke, the only operational steam-powered potter's mill in the world. It is managed by Bernard Lovett and run entirely by volunteers. If it was not for Bernard, this really significant heritage site would most likely have ceased to operate, despite being of huge historical impact, not only to Stoke-on-Trent, but to the history of ceramics manufacturing in the UK. Many other places that we value, for instance, National Trust properties, would not survive without an army of volunteers, and passing our knowledge of history on to future generations would be impossible. Volunteering is vital for society, and government needs to keep recognising this. And who knows where volunteering can, lend, uh, can lead you. My good friend Danny Flynn, the head of North Staff's YMCA, began his career in the charity sector by moving to London to work as a community service volunteer at a day centre for homeless people. Now he runs one of the most successful YMCAs in the country, and under his leadership, many young people are given a helping hand, and the monthly community meal encourages volunteer teams from across the city to cook a meal for 100 people in the community. I enjoyed taking the challenge up myself a few months ago. Every volunteering journey is different. Danica started volunteering as a community champion with Thrive at Five, a national charity who attend my round table. Supported and given the chance to learn new skills, she set up a club to support parents over the summer holidays and now has a paid position working alongside parents, walking alongside parents in their journey through the early years, all because she volunteered. We know the profound benefit that volunteering has on the individual, on communities, and on society. But there are still many barriers to overcome. I was surprised to learn, talking to my local branch of St John's Ambulance, that they have to purchase their own uniforms. And this, plus the cost of travel, can be a barrier. 
government has already invested a lot of money in removing some of these barriers and getting people involved, which I'm grateful for. In March last year, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport launched the Know Your Neighbourhood Fund of up to £30 million to widen participation in volunteering and tackle loneliness in 27 disadvantaged areas across England. However, we can still do more. Volunteers are not valued enough by wider society as a whole. The UK doesn't even measure the work of volunteers and voluntary organisations, so we can't fully credit its contribution to society. That said, the scale of the voluntary response to the pandemic was undoubtedly amazing. Millions of people looking after their neighbours reconnected the social fabric. But this hasn't persisted, because people had to go back to their jobs and have less time on their hands. I wrote an article mid-COVID discussing the importance of supporting the voluntary sector. I predicted that many of the vast army of individuals who came forward to help neighbours and, and neighbourhoods would disappear once everyone went back to their pre-COVID life. Unfortunately, this is precisely the situation we now face. Levels of formal volunteering have declined and remain well below pre-pandemic levels. While 17% of people in 2017 had volunteered in the past 12 months, by 2023 it was just 13%, representing an estimated 1.55 million fewer people volunteering over the period. The long-term trend that we see towards greater reliance on a smaller civic core is troubling. This is a real concern for charities, with 40% reporting that a lack of volunteers has stopped them meeting their main objectives. Small charities particularly, which make up 80% of the 165,000 registered charities in England, are facing huge issues with volunteer recruitment and retention. But this issue was even raised to me by national charities such as the Scouts, who make invaluable contributions to the volunteer workforce across the UK, but are currently facing challenges in volunteer recruitment, which has led to unprecedented waiting lists and a concerning decline in their workforce. The increase in need isn't being matched by an increase in volunteering capacity. In fact, many charities are in fact victims of their own success. They often deliver vital services that the public values, and which are not currently or fully delivered through public sector bodies. The voluntary sector is often asked to do more, but without the funding to match. Volunteers also need training and support. During the pandemic, we experienced an incredible volunteer army that helped on every street with shopping for neighbours who were shielding and helping the vaccine rollout. But volunteers that go into people's homes and work with the most vulnerable need training and support. I was aware of the professional requirements often required of volunteers when I visit, visited one of my local um, organisations, Birch's Head Get Growing. They're a wonderful group who collect and distribute food, clothing, household items, books and toys to address issues around poverty and waste. But coordinating a group of 30 to 40 volunteers and leading workshops and courses is a full-time job. The belief of local charities and often most significantly faith groups too, that we hold the solutions to the problems faced locally and that we can work together with the resources we already have to make an impact with an endless legacy for our communities is truly inspirational, but it becomes ever more challenging. Interestingly, we are seeing trends change in the kinds of volunteering people seek and the preference for shorter term, more flexible or one-off opportunities. This is a shift from traditional patterns providing large amounts of time to one organisation over many years. Whilst this poses challenges for organisations delivering services, it also provides opportunities to attract new and more diverse volunteers. Interestingly, 53% of new British Heart Foundation volunteer recruits between January and March 2023 were 16 to 24 year olds, compared to 42% pre-pandemic. So perhaps this is an opportunity to think about how we can retain engagement with the younger generation of volunteers. However, in doing this, we also need to make sure we address the fact that younger volunteers particularly are worried about being left out of pocket. Only half of volunteers surveyed by the NCVO said that their organisation would reimburse them for their expenses if they asked. 
The increasing financial barriers to volunteering are very likely to mean even fewer people from deprived areas volunteer. The NCVO, who do an incredible job supporting the voluntary sector, have done much work with fellow MPs through the APPG for charities and volunteering, and we'll be publishing a report at the end of May, which takes a deeper look at the time well spent data on deprivation and volunteering. When looking for other volunteers to open doors to volunteering initiatives, we should consider the workplace and the commitment that businesses have to corporate social responsibility. Many businesses already excel at supporting volunteer efforts and collaborating with charities to leverage employee volunteering to address social environmental issues. I recently heard from Amazon, who encourage employees to participate in a global month of volunteering to support causes they are passionate about. Tens of thousands of Amazon employees in the UK will volunteer alongside their peers, adding to the company's efforts to support its local communities throughout the year. In 2023 in the UK, more than 43,000 hours were spent volunteering by Amazon employees. And I'm always delighted to hear uh, everybody who volunteers, I mean, you know, even in this place, and my own staff uh, get involved with local initiatives too. Um, Matthew Bridger has pioneered volunteer projects since he was 16, setting up the house project for homeless, uh, the shoebox appeal. And Izzy Kennedy from my office often volunteers with her local primary school to mentor children who struggle to engage in the classroom. So, you know, even in this place, we can encourage our small teams to use their talents and play their part. People, particularly the younger generation, are increasingly conscious of the reputations of companies and their corporate responsibility record. That includes a desire to shop from businesses they see as ethical and a determination to work for organisations whose values they share. So let's make it easier for businesses to do this. We can work with employers to make volunteering easier. Voluntary organisations need a regular commitment, not the usual three volunteering leave days offered by employers. So I would ask the Minister to consider whether he's considered introducing a right to request paid leave for volunteering, or amending Section 50 of the Employment Rights Act 1996 to enable reasonable time off for trustee duties. School governors, for example, are already entitled to time off work under this section. Trustees play a vital role overseeing charities, but there are currently an estimated 100,000 trustee vacancies. We could make volunteering affordable by reviewing and uplifting the approved mileage allowance payment. The approved rate has not changed since 2012, despite the costs associated with motoring increasing substantially. Whilst it's primarily aimed at employees, this rate is also used to reimburse volunteers who use their own cars as part of their activities. To enable more people to give their time, I ask if the Minister might consider a fair, transparent review of this rate. And we should do more to look at the potential impact of the cost of living on university students' ability to participate in volunteering. When I spoke to Birch's Head Get Growing in my constituency, um, they provide extensive placements for university students as part of the Work Placement and Site Supervisor Scheme. More attempts to get students to volunteer like this are needed, but the situation changed following the increase in student fees and the cost of living crisis, and students have been less able or motivated to volunteer. And I've spoken in the past about social prescribing, another popular concept, but which doesn't seem to have had the funding attached at the delivery end. The idea is great. It moves us away from medicalising every person's needs and looks to helping in a different community-based way. Examples of this include helping people with obesity by signing them up to healthy activities or addressing loneliness by promoting, for example, participation in group craft activities. But the organisations who run these activities have costs to meet and those, who need, those need to come out of the budgets of prescribers. NHS England should work with the charity sector to increase social prescribing for volunteering, to improve people's health and help reduce pressure on GPs and other healthcare services. Departments should better capture and share information about government place volunteers and the onward journey of those referrals. Indeed, coming back to the topic of data, we also need to maximise the impact of the third sector satellite account within the Office of National Statistics Data 
to better understand and demonstrate the value of the charity sector and of volunteering. We should implore spe explore specific policy measures, such as those I briefly mentioned, which support and promote volunteering. But alongside this, consider how broader policy choices could affect volunteering, including broader socio-economic factors. Indeed, there is no current effective strategy for volunteering in England. So I ask the Minister how much he consults with other departments about the impact of volunteering and policy making across a wide range of other issues, and whether he will partner with other organisations, such as the NCVO, to draw on the learning, experience and evidence of the sector to set a strategic direction for volunteering. I'm a great believer in trusting the people and so I am keen for our local voluntary sector who works so closely with our local communities to articulate a strong vision of what a collective approach might mean to develop a volunteering strategy that might work for Stoke-on-Trent. And I look to the Minister for maybe developing a strategy that will work for the country. The question is, this House has considered the of volunteers. Vera Hophouse. Ms. Noakes, it's a pleasure to serve with you in the chair, and I congratulate the Honourable Ma Lady for Stoke-on-Trent for bringing this important issue to um, the floor of this chamber. Ms. Noakes, volunteering is the beating heart of my Bath constituency. Without our volunteers, our charities would simply not survive and sustain the essential activities and services offered to communities. And let's only look back to the monumental volunteering effort during COVID, helping with the vaccine rollout, uh, providing essential goods and medicines to those who were shielding and to ensure vulnerable individuals received essential support. Our communities are so much stronger for, our for the volunteering, and I'm so grateful to this culture of goodwill and being kind to one another across my bath communities. It makes for a much better and stronger society. And today is a, a wonderful opportunity to say thank you to all of our, our, our volunteers who are making this enormous effort. And whenever I meet a volunteer, they don't do that for the glory um, or the public recognition. They're doing it because they are passionately committed to the causes that they support. But today is an opportunity to make um, a public recognition to what they're doing for us. Um, I would be um, in danger of um, missing out um, any of, uh, of the many, many voluntary organizations in my constituency. And therefore, I just want to pay tribute to Mbain's 3SG, which is a membership network of over 200 charities, social enterprises, and community groups in Bath and Northeast Somerset. And they really came together during um, COVID-19. And, and I hear the Honorable Lady is organizing a volunteers' fair, uh, which uh, they have also organized, but they might look at the model of what Bain's 3SG has done in the last four years. It really transformed um, um, the whole of the volunteering and charitable sector and third sector um, in my Bath community. 3MGS does fantastic work to support the charities, social enterprise, faith, and voluntary sector operating in Bath and North East Somerset. They aim to strengthen the volunteering offer, and last year held a volunteer fair that brought together local charities, residents, and businesses. Having organizations like 3GS, who facilitate cooperation between community organizations and statutory bodies in Baines, make a huge impact to the lives of so many people, and as I've just said, it has really uh, transformed um, how it's all delivered across uh, Bath and Lucy Somerset. Ms. Noakes, today's debate is not just um, about saying thank you, but also pointing out about um, the, the, the challenges that really volunteering and the third sector uh, faces, and the Honourable Lady for Stoke-on-Trent has already touched on many of those, um, but let me um, re repeat or say some, a little bit more on some of those. Volunteers come from all walks of life, and it is important that we make volunteering accessible for all and identify the barriers to volunteering in every, any given area. It is also important to recognize that volunteers are on their own personal journey and may come to giving their time for various reasons, but as I said, most of the time because they passionately believe in making a difference. It provides connections and support network that people may not otherwise receive. The sector 
is at, uh, as a whole faces lots of, of challenges, not least um, facing huge cuts in financial pressures at a time when we are seeing a rise in need, and often these organizations are supporting people that are falling through the gaps. There is huge potential for better link-ups to support preventative work though, through initiatives such as social prescribing, which the Honorable Lady has already extensively talked about, of which volunteering can also play a part. Many charities report one of the biggest issues they face is coping with increasing demand on services while also having to fund, find long-term sustainable funding. Charities are almost four times more likely to identify funding issues as the most pressing issue facing their organization than any other issue, year on year since 2015. Volunteering is essential to help address this additional demand. Unfortunately, volunteering has been severely impacted by COVID-19 and has not recovered since. Data from the Charities Aid Foundation's UK giving report found that only 13% of people said they volunteered in 2023, compared with 17% pre-pandemic. This represents about 1.6 million fewer people volunteering over the past five years, and that is a very big number. The National Council for Voluntary Organizations Survey on the volunteer experience found a trend in decline in certain volunteering activities, including raising money or taking part in sponsored events. Another reported barrier to people volunteering more is reported worries about being out of pocket, and we have heard this this afternoon already. This is exacerbated by the recent rise in the cost of living. For example, if someone previously commuted to a volunteering position by train, the increased fares may push them over the edge of affordability. Work commitments and caring responsibility are also often cited as significant reasons for not volunteering. In many ways, it is not a surprise that as life gets harder, people's attention focuses elsewhere and volunteering will then decrease. Volunteering, as we've also heard, has lots of benefits. Research has shown that people who take part in volunteering report improved well-being life satisfaction, and lower rates of depression. As mentioned earlier, it is also so important for our local communities to thrive. One issue, particularly amongst younger volunteers, is lower reported satisfaction rates from volunteering. A long-term focus on helping people find opportunities that suit them would improve fulfillment and increase retention of volunteers. Trying to uh, maintain volunteers' numbers as well as recruit new volunteers is a constant challenge, challenge for charities. The good news is that willingness to volunteer remains very high. If we can address some of the barriers that prevent people from feeling they can volunteer, there is an untapped potential um, of people willing to do so. According to the National Survey on the Volunteer Experience, the top two cited reasons for people being encouraged to volunteer is they could be flexible with the time they're committed and flexible with the way they get involved, such as volunteering from home. There's also encouragement that these can be addressed with the data showing that flexibility is how people volu uh, volunteering is increasing. And I know many charities in Bath are eager to do this. Ms. Noakes, volunteers carry out incredible work to help support non-statutory services, and it is wonderful to have a debate that shines a light on this subject, and once again, to say thank you to the thousands and millions of volunteers across the country who are making, helping to make our society better and richer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Noakes, and it is a privilege to serve under you uh, as chair. I should say, first up, that it would be really very tempting to just list the thousands of volunteers that we have in Mid and East Devon. Um, and forgive me, I, I, I meant to serve with you in the chair. It would be tempting to list the thousands and thousands of, of volunteers that we have in Mid and East Devon who I represent. Um, and I won't do that because if I did, I know that I'd miss some. Um, and so instead, I want to use a specific example uh, and an example I know well, that is uh, the Scout Movement. And I'm very grateful to Molly Taylor, uh, who has written um, and done some research 
uh, for us all, those of us who wanted to speak in this debate today uh, on the subject of the Scout movement. Um, the, uh, I should say uh, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for Stoke-on-Trent Central for uh, applying for this debate and, uh, and also for pointing out about how some people have got out of the habit of volunteering. Uh, and, and this is... Uh, it, the, the, the pandemic had this sort of uh, effect where, on the one hand, it was really good for some because it got people involved in their communities and got them volunteering to support others. But on the other hand, um, it also meant those people who had volunteered for decades were given the opportunity to stay, uh, stay away and reflect from, on the volunteering that they had done. Uh, and so if we think about uh, the Scout movement in particular, 155,000 volunteers uh, were, were volunteering adults and young people in 2020. And that dropped to 140,000 volunteers in 2021. Uh, and I should say that has now been partly restored to 143,000 volunteers. But um, for me, what is the real crying shame is that there are 100,000 young people um, on the waiting list who cannot join uh, a scout group for want of another 40,000 uh, volunteer adults. And um, I, I know from my own involvement in the scout movement, both as a young person as, uh, and a, as a volunteer, that this can be really transformative for young people. Um, I, I mean, I think about how uh, this is a movement that exists for people of all socioeconomic backgrounds, um, for all academic abilities. And um, I should say, uh, what I've seen in, in Columpton Scouts, for example, is that you might find individuals, young people who don't perform particularly well in an academic setting, but put them into an outdoor environment and, uh, and they really thrive and they really show their, their leadership potential. And that's really brought on by people who volunteer. People like James Puchowski, who uh, is the, the group scout leader of, of Columpton Scouts. But I'd like to just give a couple of other examples as well. Um, Helen Turner, who uh, <coughs> was uh, the group scout leader of Honiton Scouts. She has been recognized as an honored citizen of, of Honiton for her 32 years as a leader. Now, I should say, when you get approached and asked if you uh, can, or, or if one is approached and asked if they can, might volunteer to, uh, to, to do something like scouting, they might not anticipate uh, that it's going to consume that much of their life, but actually it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the pleasure of volunteering that keeps people in it and doing it for so long. Uh, people like James Bicknell from Will and Scouts, uh, a, um, a former officer in the Royal Navy who has taken his public service ethos from, uh, from his workplace into his time off uh, and has really imbued that in the young people with whom he is working. So it can be really transformative for, um, for young people and that gives a great deal of satisfaction to the adults who are involved. I think sometimes the organisation and structure of some of the volunteer organisations that we've heard about today can lead others to suppose that uh, the volunteers are in fact paid. And um, certainly I think that's, that's very true of scouting because it's, it's sort of uniformed, it all looks very formal. There is this, sometimes this assumption that somehow there must be some, uh, some remuneration in the background or even payment of expenses. I was interested to hear about uh, this idea that the, um, the, the mileage allowance rate should be uplifted. I, that strikes me as being very sensible um, for, all, for all manner of workplaces, um, it probably won't affect everybody in the volunteer environment because I, a lot of the volunteers I know um, don't claim expenses, will never uh, have any opportunity to claim expenses, and that uh, would, would, also, would actually probably um, detract from why they do it. They, they do it for the love of volunteering. They do it for the satisfaction it gives them. I think it, it would be very easy in this debate um, only to talk about the, the upsides and uh, to shy away from talking about sometimes some of the things that, um, that go wrong in volunteering. Um, and, and there have been, there have been, in, in, in lots of um, volunteer organisations, there have been incidents and accidents, there have been tragedies. And for this reason, uh, volunteer organisations work um, now, with, with quite strict health and safety and safeguarding rules, and quite right that they should do. But again, it's a tribute to the people who get stuck into this that they are willing to take on that responsibility. Uh, because if we didn't have people who were 
who had the broad shoulders to accept that even though they, they don't get anything out of it themselves, even though they're opening themselves up to greater liability in this age of litigation, nonetheless, they've got the breadth of shoulders to take on the responsibility anyway. Why do they do it? Um, I suggest it is because um, of the outcomes. And again, if, if you talk to people involved in scouting, they say uh, the, the paperwork might sometimes be a chore, but they do it because they see young people grow and thrive. And, uh, and, and I think uh, for that, that probably explains why when the Royal Voluntary Service has polled people on uh, what they get out of volunteering, 49% say they become happier, 52% say they feel more connected to their community, and 56% say they feel more fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Noakes. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship today. And um, can I also take this opportunity to congratulate the Honourable Member for Stoke and Trent Central on uh, securing what I think has been quite an uplifting debate to conclude the, conclude the, the week on. And I, I think that the Honourable Member for Stoke and Trent um, captured very, very well indeed in our opening uh, remarks that the broad sweep of the, the scope of volunteering and the, the contribution it makes not only to the, the communities which benefit but also the benefits that those engaging in that volunteering activity themselves get. Now I can't possibly begin to try and name check everybody in my constituency of whom I am aware, there are many more of whom I will not be aware, who make that kind of contribution. I'm sure we're all in exactly the, uh, the same situation. But I would just like to, to mention three, just to give a, a sense of, of the scope. Um, there is uh, the Gordon Rural Action Group, who fulfil in many ways the functions that many of us would recognise through the Citizens Advice Bureaus. That they do a power of work through various initiatives and through direct help to uh, reducing um, social exclusion and tackling uh, poverty, particularly in the more rural outlying parts of my Aberdeenshire constituency. There's the, the Men's Shed in Ellen, which I'm looking forward very much to visiting uh, next week. Um, and there's also uh, the, the, the committee, the powerhouses behind the Victoria Hall in that town of Ellen as well. Now, the Victoria Hall was a, a, a council-owned asset, um, a very, very handsome building, um, which was a uh, a bit unloved, it wasn't really being used to its full potential. There was a community asset transfer, a really go-getting committee of local people got behind it. And now uh, the, 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 the building is block booked for dancing, for exercise classes, for just about anything you could imagine. It's even been transformed into a cinema with all the digital projectors and everything there as the, the volunteers have really seized that. And it is now a, the beating, thriving hub of the, the town in many respects, breathing life not just back into the building but into the town. There's also the many uh, rotary groups, uh, uh, clubs across the district. And I used to, before life got kind of busy with uh, parenthood and politics, uh, I was a very proud member of the, the Rotary Club in Old Meldrum. And every year, through a variety of uh, activities, we, we, we raised thousands of pounds to support local charities and international charities. Uh, we supported the efforts of Rotary International to eradicate polio around the world. Uh, we embarked on a m many other projects locally which were also able to gain significant financial backing from other partners. We ran mock job interviews at the local school, cookery and music competitions for young people, sent young people on outward bound educational courses so that they could understand their own potential as, as individuals. And uh, we, the more green fingered amongst us tended to the community garden, cut the grass at the old folks home. And thanks to the combined efforts of Rotary Clubs across the North East, the uh, the, the, we put on the, the Haddo House Egg Hunt, which is uh, still, I think, the biggest, largest single free public event that takes place in the northeast of Scotland and which has been beloved by generations of uh, families across the region. So organisations are important. The individual effort is crucial, but the organisations are important because what they do is they match the individual's willingness to contribute and their energy that they can contribute with the opportunity to contribute positively. And that's good for the organisations. It's most obviously good for the broader community. But it's also, as we've heard, excellent in many respects for the individuals concerned and what they get out of that activity. So to all the, the volunteers and those who help to enable that volunteering, I would like to add my own heartfelt and sincere thank you for everything that you do and all 
that you contribute to the common good. There's a long and proud tradition of, of volunteering. I, I think we're all quite used to the idea of the third sector and charities providing services in our communities with the help of volunteers and with or without the help of government money. And there's absolutely nothing that's intrinsically wrong with the idea that government should be helping to encourage and enable uh, individuals to step in and help do things that the state can't or which private business either won't or perhaps shouldn't. And when we think of volunteering in proximity to the public sector, um, it's probably something like the, the Royal Voluntary Service running the cafes in our local hospitals, as my mother used to do at the, the Western General in, in Edinburgh, uh, or perhaps a community transport service helping people to get around the, the area rather than filling in for the full-time professional agencies of central or local government. But I think we can, we can also think more broadly. We can think of the work of the retained firefighting service or the spe or special constables. The RNLI, for example, has always relied on volunteers. Well, the work of first responders in assisting the ambulance service across rural parts of the country has helped to save countless lives in situations where minutes really can be the difference between life and death. So volunteering brings a great deal to the table that central and local government can never be able to do and should never be expected to, to do. But it's about making sure that in order to get that added benefit that we are helping people to have the time to give and offering them suitable outlets through which to give it. Now, the member for Stoke and Trent Central made, I think, a number of extremely good suggestions on how uh, volunteering could perhaps be incentivised. Now, we live, I think it's possibly something we could all agree on, we live in a society where many people are, are, are underworked and there's many others who feel themselves to be greatly overworked. And I think that there's a, a lot which can be done within that space to assist more people who might find the, uh, who would welcome the opportunity to volunteer. Now, we've had for some time the right to ask for flexible working, even if there's no corresponding uh, uh, entitlement to, to always get it. So that, that right to at least ask for it now exists, but it's much harder, I would contend, for many small businesses or small to medium enterprises to be able to support an employee in that, no matter what other benefits that individual may, may get and how they may, may grow uh, in, in the process of doing. So even something as basic as offering greater support to employers to allow those who wish to volunteer or who need to work unconventional hours in order to do so, whether that's for volunteering in its purest sense or whether it's for caring responsibilities for family, for a child or an older relative, that could transform not just the, the economy, but it could transform the quality of life for millions and millions of people. Now, it does seem incredible that until comparatively recently someone claiming unemployment related benefits were actually being penalised through the threat of withdrawal of those benefits if they volunteered more than, than 16 hours um, when a, a volunteering position could have given them some purpose and helped to build some skills and some confidence there which would go on to help everybody. So I'm delighted that the rules have uh, changed in that regard and that those who are benefit claimants are now able to have that volunteering commitment recognised and that that is allowed for with, without the, the penalties that were, were there previously. But I think there's still uh, more to do in this space. And I do find myself asking why it is that some of the most experienced in our workforce find it so difficult to scale back their hours as they approach retirement without jeopardising either that position in the workplace or perhaps future pension entitlements, depending on the rules of the schemes that apply to them. Because um, that continuing with that sort of inflexibility, it not only creates a for some people, a very disorientating shock when they eventually do leave the work feed place when retirement comes. It also deprives people of the opportunities to find future roles in the communities, to try things out and to transition to what life at the end of, of, of a career and life after work might actually look like. It deprives people, I would say, of the opportunity to transition smoothly into that uh, post-work environment to do something worthwhile while also helping others to make the most of what life has to offer them. So if you want to, to, to look at it this way, we, we have quite a, a big society, to use a phrase that was in vogue some, some years ago, but we, we don't make that society bigger or better by making the state smaller, but we could make the, use the power of 
the state to help grow that society and allow people to get more out of their life and more out of their contribution in work and in the community to the great benefit of all. Now, in June 2021, I took part in another Westminster Hall debate and the, the community response to COVID. And it's, it's quite right that there was a lot of people volunteered it, it really rushed to the fore in that crisis. And it's saddening that much of that volunteering effort seems to have tailed off because part of my hopes for building back better was certainly to build back better by harnessing that goodwill and commitment and community spirit that, that came to the fore during that time. But I will conclude today much as I, I concluded then that often it's in the worst of circumstances that we find the best of ourselves and community and volunteering are intertwined with one another and with the understanding that each of us is part of something which is much much greater uh, than us and bigger than ourselves and that our greatest calling in life whatever we do is to be called and to serve in the service of others thank you to our volunteers thank you to the member for Stoke and Trent for securing this debate and thank everybody for their time. Sir Chris Bryant. Mrs Noakes, it couldn't possibly be a better um, way of spending this afternoon than uh, taking part in a debate under your chair. Um, uh, it is, as you pointed out to me earlier, not just a privilege, but a massive privilege to be sitting here taking part in this debate with you in the chair. Um, and um, I do want to pay tribute to the uh, Honourable Member for Stoke-on-Trent Central for um, uh, bringing, bringing us to this debate, but I am actually scandalised by every single one of the contributions so far, because the largest number of volunteers who are out today are probably volunteering for political parties, and they haven't even got a mention yet, and they're the people who go out in sun and rain. Um, um, in uh, foul weather and fine, uh, they get um, sometimes spat at. I've been shot at on one occasion. Um, they get uh, abuse. Um, sometimes they get people giving them the thumbs up. But they do that because they believe in the d political system and, and in democracy. And we all know that not one of us would ever be here if it weren't for the contributions of volunteers in our political parties up and down the country. So um, they were, they'd, they'd be far too busy today. Um, but uh, I, I would just like to put on uh, record, um, I'm sure on behalf of all of us, our, our tributes to the, the volunteers in our political parties who do it for no other than reward than um, the, the, the things that they believe in and trying to make a better, uh, better world and a better country um, in, in the individual ways that they have. Of course, I pay tribute too to the members for Bath and Tiverton and Honiton and Gordon. I think we've all had the same briefing note from the Scouts. Um, so I'm not going to repeat anything um, <laughs> that would seem rather otios and you might rule me out of order, um, um, uh, Mrs Noakes. So I, I'm not going to do that. But um, the, I, I do, however, want to disagree with the members who said that they're not going to list all their volunteers in their own constituency because um, I am going to refer to some of the um, things in my I represent one of the poorest constituencies in the land and, and you could argue in Europe according to some socio-economic indicators. And the truth is that um, I know there are politicians who believe that private is always good and you should leave everything to the market and public is bad and you should try to shrink the state and there are those who believe that private is always bad because it's based on, based on profit and, and actually you, know, you want everything to be done by the state. Um, I've never subscribed to either of those views. I think it's horses for courses. Um, but I also believe that the third sector is absolutely essential to making either of the other two sectors work. Um, you, you, in fact, most of what we would consider as um, the welfare states, um, schools and hospitals and so on, sprang out of the churches and out of the voluntary sector originally. Um, and if you look at um, the, the NHS simply wouldn't be able to function in most parts of the country without the support of volunteers. I don't necessarily mean people fundraising for scanners or whatever or, or, or um, running events locally. It's, it's all the additional bits that make um, the recuperative process possible for so many patients. Once they've had what they get from the NHS, they need that extra from the voluntary um, sector. And if I look in my own patch... Um, organisations like Valley's Kids are probably the, the, have probably more, made more difference than any other organisation to the opportunities, the life opportunities of some of the um, kids in the most difficult families and, and difficult parts of the country. Uh, uh, yes, Bath, calls. We agree that actually the charitable sector is so good to making the most out of every penny and in fact doubling and tripling the amount um, that is sort of invested um, by actually um, capturing then the volunteering effort. But they need that bit of seed funding and not always be under threat that this funding is being cut. 
Absolutely, and I think one of the difficulties sometimes is that because they end up with a memorandum of understanding or some kind of contract with the local authority or, or with the local health board, as we have in Wales, different structure from in England, um, then sometimes they end up effectively being part of um, the, uh, of the state sector, and that makes them less flexible and less able to adapt to um, situations around them. And, and that, that has been a worrying trend over the last 20, 25 years. And maintaining that sustainability for them um, is the real challenge. And I know that's one of the problems that's facing Valley's kids at the moment, trying to make sure that they've got a strong financial future. Um, uh, sporting marvels, sometimes we refer to charities, which is obviously quite a strict definition, but actually lots of people volunteer for things that aren't charities, but nonetheless, I would argue, have a charitable um, end result. So all the sporting bodies in, in, in my patch, and the people who turn up as coaches on a Saturday and a Sunday morning for um, the football teams or, the, or um, Ferndale Rugby Club, I'm not going to go through all the rugby clubs in there on there, um, um, but I'm patron of Ferndale Rugby Club, so, um, and they've got their presentation dinner in a few weeks' time. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, so many of these organisations don't actually get any financial support from the state at all um, because they, and they don't even get charitable status, um, that they struggle, even, it's an even more complicated process. And, as has already been alluded to, the, the kind of rules about what you can do, um, quite understandably, if you're working with children and so on, are onerous and complicated and difficult. Um, I'm very conscious in relation to the work I've done about acquired brain injury that you, you, you want any coach working in football or sport uh, or rugby to have a full understanding, um, or for that matter cycling, um, to have a full understanding of how, that, of how um, the, the, the new rules and protocols work and when to take a child off if they've had a concussion and so on. Um, all of these things, of course do make some people think twice about whether they should be engaged in volunteering. And that's why I think the state sometimes has a role in trying to make sure that the process is as simple as possible and that the charities have, um, and all the different organisations, have um, access to good, easy, readily understood um, uh, advice. Um, uh, I just want to mention uh, one other, if that's okay, um, uh, which is um, the Ronda Polar Bears, um, which I'm also patron. This is a, a charity that works with um, kids who have a variety of different disabilities, teaching them to swim. Um, and uh, I, I will probably see them later this evening if I get back to the Ronda in time. Um, at Astra Sports Centre. Uh, yes, of course. Richard Ford. I'm great, grateful for the Shadow Minister. Um, given that he's a trustee of a charity, does he recognise that uh, for employers to release volunteers for work in the voluntary sector, that can uh, actually be beneficial for employers, including those in the private sector? Yes, I was actually, the next word here is trustees. Um, and it's a very important point, which is obviously if you're a, if you're a governor of a school um, or if you're a magistrate, you know, there are, or if you're a, a reservist in the armed forces, there are specific rules about what, um, what you can expect from your employer. Um, and, uh, you know, many employers are absolutely delighted to be able to support the, the work of, the, of their staff, though it's much more difficult, obviously, if you're in a small company. Um, but th the point is made about trustees as well. I was actually going to make a slightly different point about trustees, which is that sometimes it's, it may be easy, um, for all I know, to find lots of trustees who know how to deal with the banking system or um, charitable law or whatever in Surrey. Um, it's more difficult in some of the areas that actually most need um, the support. And that's why I think organisations um, such as the NCVO and uh, the Prince's Trust have been really important in, in, in providing mentoring and support in areas such as mine uh, in the South Wales Valleys, um, where we'd love to have more trustees, and we often end up getting the same people be, to be the trustees of all the different charities and all the different organisations, such as the Ronda Arts Festival um, which uh, is coming up at the end of June as well. Um, I'm a trustee of that as well. I, I, I don't have any financial interest in that, um, but I should declare it nonetheless. Um, and then there are the individuals. Uh, Stan Power is no longer with us, but he was um, a, a veteran. Um, he uh, served. Um, he took it upon himself for many, many years as a member of the Royal British Region Legion to make sure that anybody he came into contact with who'd ever been in the armed forces in the Ronda knew of every single thing that they were entitled to claim for, any, any kind of support that they could get. Now, he did that entirely off his own bat, but obviously with the support of the Royal British Legion. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful man, who I think made um, life-changing possibilities for dozens and dozens of people in my constituency. And the more that we can enable a few more of those people in every constituency in the land, the better. 
Um, just one charity I want to refer to which uh, works across the whole of the country because I think it amplifies um, the, the, um, the kind of problems that we do have at the moment that have been alluded to by others um, is uh, Headway. Um, uh, I know the Minister knows about Headway. Uh, this is a charity that works with people who've had an acquired brain injury. Um, obviously, uh, one of the great things we've done in recent years because of the government's brave decision in some cases to create uh, major trauma centres and um, is that we have saved many more people's lives when they've been in an accident, many of them with brain injuries, but then trying to get them the, the quality of life that we would be able to bring them if they had full rehabilitation um, is very difficult. The, the, um, all the different therapies um, in hospitals are very, very stretched. And that's why we rely often for rehab on, on charities like, such as Headway up and down the country, and most constituencies will, will um, have a, a Headway group. Uh, 1,100 volunteers helping with um, rehabilitation, 500 more working setting up branches, 400 working in the retail shops. I mean, that, that is a really important part of the network that enables people to get back a quality of life. And that is really important for the whole of our economy. Um, unfortunately, the government, um, this is not a partisan attack, but they, they don't know how many people in the UK are living with an acquired brain injury. It's just not a fact. We reckon it's somewhere in the region of 1.4 million. Um, the charitable sector probably has a better idea than others. But Headway is really struggling financially. Many of its branches are um, worrying about whether they'll be able to continue, partly because of a lack of volunteers, but mostly because of a lack of finance. And rehabilitation and the kit that you need is quite often um, expensive. So um, I really hope that uh, at some point we're going to have a major review of how charities end up with their funding and, and how we can make sure that they are sustainable uh, into the future. Members have referred several to the, uh, the fact that volunteering is good for you. And you can certainly see that in Headway, because quite often the person who will take you around your Headway group will be somebody who 10 years ago had a brain injury, um, uh, was looked after, um, had rehab, was re-socialized, found a family of people, um, uh, then volunteered, volunteered a bit more, volunteered a bit more, then got a few days work, and now is, is the full-time staff employee. Now, that is, that is rehabilitation at its absolute best and volunteering at its best. And you could repeat that in every other kind of um, charity that we've been talking about. And volunteering is good for you. It makes you feel useful. It, it means you can gain skills, especially because you might have to retrain in areas where you didn't have skills at all in the past. Um, it re-socializes you. Um, it makes people feel happier. Um, and, and, and I note the point that was made about people, well, I'm 62, and, and there are some people in the room who are slightly older than I am, and, uh, uh, and maybe thinking about what they're going to do with their retirement. And, um, and of course, it's a really important part of um, still feeling that you have something to contribute, um, and often really important skills that can be fed back into the community from older people. Um, there are problems. Um, th there has been a significant collapse. It's been referred to already in numbers of volunteers from one in four people of working age to one in six in the last few years. That is problematic. 40% of charities now report or reported in 2022 that, volunteer, that a lack of volunteers meant that they couldn't progress, they couldn't grow, or they couldn't even commit um, to the projects that they were already engaged in. Um, some areas, as I've said before, have found it particularly difficult because the financial barriers, if you're really struggling financially and economically and to put food on the table for your kids, um, then you know, the bus fare or the train fare, even if it's only £2.90 or £4.60 or whatever, is prohibitive for you. Um, and, and many people will feel reluctant to ask for the charity for the money, and so they end up just not volunteering at all. So... I, I, I'd love it if there was some form of bank um, where all of this could be met, um, and uh, maybe that's a project for somebody for the future, but a particular um, charitable venture. Um, local authorities have been struggling financially enormously. I know from my own patch in, in Rondekan and Taff, uh, you know, they found it really difficult to maintain their financial, financial commitments, let alone increase them in line with inflation. Um, as has been needed over the last few years. And that has really meant lots of charities have struggled. Um, and then on top of that, people not using charity shops so much. Um, uh, and that's had a knock-on effect for um, income as well. Uh, I think it's already been referred to that um, the Scouts have something in the region of 100,000 young people on waiting lists. Well, wouldn't it be brilliant if we could get every single one of them um, into, into the Scouts? I, I, I'm a Scout from many years ago. Um, I have a few badges. Um, my, 
which I won't go into. Um, but, um, the, but I note in the Ronda, we would love it if we were able to have more troops because we've got kids who would like to do it. And, and the same goes for the Sea Cadets, um, and for a whole series of other organisations um, which give kids a sense of purpose, um, an idea of themselves, uh, an extracurricular set of activities that is a different form of learning, um, gives them confidence, um, in many ways very similar to some of the creative industries. Um, and so I would dearly love uh, to be able to see the Scouts able to recruit far more um, volunteers. Um, uh, just a, a couple of final points. The first is about philanthropy. Um, I do look sometimes at other countries. I, I had dinner on Tuesday night with Edward Bertinsky, who's a, a Canadian artist, um, photographer, absolutely wonderful artist. And he was talking about um, how in Canada, the, the pattern of philanthropy is if you became a rich person, if you become a billionaire, you, it is axiomatic that you will become a massive philanthropist. And you will want to set up your charity and you will want to give to a wide variety of different charities. That hasn't become the norm in the UK in the same way as it has in, the, in America and Canada and some other countries. And I think there is still room for us to explore how we can incentivize that even more and making it part of our national um, uh, psyche into the future. Um, and the next point is about companies. Several, have referred, several members have referred to um, how important it is um, for that companies often are passionate about their local community because they know that that's where they derive their wealth from. It's where, um, if they want to incentivize their staff as well, they want to play an important part in, in their local community. Some of them have been really strapped financially because of energy costs and things like that. But the more we can praise those companies who make that kind of radical difference in their, in their local community, um, uh, I, I think the better. And maybe we need to think of new ways um, of badging and thanking them um, for the extraordinary things they've done. And then I suppose my final point is, is just about the role of the state in all of this. Um, it's very difficult. I, I, I sometimes feel at this particular moment in British politics quite depressed um, because it feels as if so many parts of what we have relied on um, in our past just don't work as well as they used to. Um, now, some people will say, well, let's try and recreate the kind of social fabric of the 1950s. I don't think that works. Um, the world has moved on. We, we, you know, the internet and social media and so on have completely changed things. But I do, I do want to return to that sense of um, public engagement, a, a sense that we achieve far more by our common endeavor than we do by going it alone. Um, now, I could make a, a party political point about, you know, if we press the reset button, then in a general election, maybe some of that will be achieved. But actually, I think even more important, and politicians and the state play a role in this, is trying to make sure that the whole of the country feels engaged in the national project, that the whole of the local community feels engaged in the local project. And you cannot do that without people volunteering for the common good. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure as ever, to serve under your chairmanship, Ms. Noakes. And uh, I'd also like to pay tribute to my honourable friend, the member for Stoke-on-Trent uh, Stoke Central, for securing this really important debate. And as we were going through it, uh, I was reflecting on my own portfolio within DCMS and thinking that actually for many of the uh, issues that I have responsibility for, much of it wouldn't function if it wasn't for the fact that we have volunteers giving of their time up and down the country. The Honourable Gentleman mentioned sport, and he's absolutely right. that there are, In fact, it is the biggest cohort of volunteers are in the sports world. Uh, and they are holding all of these um, groups up and down the country, keeping our nation active. The youth sector that I have responsibility for, so much of it run by volunteers and particularly supporting disadvantaged young people who need that sort of extra support and mentorship. And then also I was thinking about the civil society sector, having worked in the hospice movement myself, I know there's no way we could have raised the money we needed to if it wasn't for people giving of their time. And these ceremonials, the coronation was a classic example of thousands of volunteers giving their time, making sure that, that spectacular event ran incredibly smoothly. Now, I too will have to, of course, mention constituency organisations, but I'm terrified of leaving any of them out. But I 
you know, there are groups like the Live at Home schemes that look after people of an older generation. There are in, in bloom groups and litter groups that look after our environment. And, of course, the sporting groups that I've mentioned. Uh, and I also am proud to be a part of the Guy's Delights uh, organization which puts on huge street parties every year We're enabling charities to raise the money they need to continue their individual work and I say thank you to so many of the volunteers like Claire and Jim and Caroline and Stephen and Lee and Vicky and well I have to say Caroline runs our Prosecco stall and I do wonder how much of it she sneaks uh, every now and again but I also want to join what the honourable gentleman in thanking the political volunteers who are out there today it's a good point well made uh, and it's not easy for them at times and I'm really grateful but also want to mention people who support work in the health sector and uh, I understand Miss Noakes that your own dad uh, is a volunteer car driver uh, enabling elderly people to get to their medical appointments, even though he's 81 years of age himself, which is fantastic. And that is precisely why I and the government are committed to growing volunteering and, and trying to give people more opportunities to volunteer and celebrating the millions of people that already make a difference by giving up their time. And I want to begin by recognising the power of volunteering. As others have said, it's a cornerstone of our society uh, and I'm grateful for the selflessness that we see. But quality volunteering also requires effort and support, and so I'd also want to pay tribute to the people that make volunteering happen uh, and who work tirelessly, working with volunteers day in and day out. And as others have mentioned, uh, this year marks the landmark 40th anniversary of uh, Volunteers Week, and I know that all members will join me in praising those millions of volunteers up and down the country for the difference that they make. This year's Volunteers Week will also culminate with the second big Help Out weekend. Uh, this provides people an opportunity to take part in volunteering in their local area, and many of them for the first time. Uh, and this is a fantastic way of introducing people to the benefits of volunteering, and I'm glad that we've been able to provide uh, funding to enable that to happen. And I was absolutely delighted to be at the launch of their, of their event this year, the Big Help Out campaign earlier this year. And I look forward to seeing even more people taking part uh, in that over the course of the weekend. And I hope that many of honourable members here will do so too. But recognising volunteers shouldn't be li limited to once a year, though. And that is why my department works closely with Number 10 to coordinate the Points of Light Award, where the Prime Minister recognises outstanding individuals and who work in their community, inspiring others too. And it's an essential part, really, of telling the story of individual volunteers from around the country and the remarkable efforts that they make. And I would encourage honourable members to look at the... Um, DCS, DCMS social media, you'll see some really inspiring stories. Um, I also want, uh, but you know, it's not enough, however, just to celebrate volunteering, and we certainly cannot take volunteers for granted. Uh, my department works to strengthen our knowledge about volunteering, including what motivates people to volunteer, and as others have mentioned, what are the barriers from preventing them to do so. And we do know that recruitment and retention is an increasing problem, particularly for the small local charities. And, and there continues to be barriers uh, to more people becoming involved in vo volunteering, which does range from a lack of awareness of the uh, volunteering opportunities that exist to simply just not having enough time. Uh, and as others have referred to in the Community Life Survey, found that 25 million individuals uh, volunteered at least once in the preceding years. Now, that's great. I'm very proud of those figures. Uh, but it is true that these have been in gentle decline over the last decade. So a lot of research has been carried out on why this may be and what we can do to try and reverse that trend. And one of these pieces of research is the Time Well Spent report that others have mentioned, run by NCVO and uh, funded by my department. And it is well worth looking in depth at the findings of that research. And we can see from this and other studies uh, that the nature of volunteering is really shifting. Broadly speaking, people are looking for opportunities that are far more flexible, perhaps easier to start, and are more connected to their communities. 
Um, but that is why we're also doing things like the National Youth Guarantee, which is providing every young person by 2025 something to do after school, have an experience away from home, but crucially, an opportunity to volunteer in the hope that that will then be uh, something that they will continue to do throughout their lives. And a number of people have mentioned the Scouts and the, and the Guides, and I'm pleased that um, as part of that, we've given £16 million to uniformed uh, uh, organisations and pleased to say that new groups are being set up. We have now provided another 4,500 new places, but I do recognise there are, is a big waiting list and I'm glad to see we have representatives in the public gallery because in my con um, interactions with them, I've been inspired by, that, by their dedication and I want to see more of those opportunities for young people. Um, we also need to recognise and celebrate the huge number of people that support others in their community through their own volition and who might not even think of themselves as volunteers. And as others have said, we saw that during the pandemic where people wanted to ensure that their neighbours were safe, they got the food they needed. But a lot of that was coordinated through local organisations and charities, and I'm grateful to them. And I think of, I've said in my own constituency that did so much during that time. I've already mentioned the importance of re re um, rewarding and recognising volunteers uh, through the points of light and the honour system. Um, and we know that the desire to make a difference is the most important motivation uh, for getting people involved in their communities. But beyond our work to recognise volunteers, we are providing funding and working with an extensive range of partners to ensure that there are clear entry points for volunteering. Two years ago, as my honourable friend mentioned, the Know Your Neighbourhood Fund was launched and this provides £30 million including £10 million from the Lottery Community Fund to directly support ch uh, charities and uh, uh, community organisations to widen participation in volunteering, but crucially to tackle loneliness. Uh, and that's happening in 27 of the most disadvantaged areas. And I'm thrilled that we're able to support uh, those charities and communities in this way, in the hope that that will help us build the infrastructure we need and uh, create those uh, opportunities to volunteer. One such example is the vision for volunteering, uh, and uh, this is a sector-led initiative developed uh, to develop uh, volunteering in England over the next 10 years. Uh, the government has supported the vision and from its outset, and we're sitting on its advisory board and lending our support and funding to take this forward because it recognises the nature of volunteering is, is, is shifting, and we want to help communities adapt to that. For, for example, one of the themes of the vision is to increase equity and inclusion, ensuring that volunteering is accessible and welcoming to everyone, everywhere. And I was thrilled to meet some of the partner organisations just yesterday, alongside other agencies that also support civil society. We were specifically talking about the crucial role these support organisations play in providing the infrastructure for volunteering. And we're looking forward to working collectively to see what we can do to help them in what are sometimes very challenging times. Um, I also uh, want to mention that you know, the British public's enthusiasm for volunteering was also, as I said earlier at the opening of my comments, seen very clearly at the coronation of His Majesty the King. And it is exactly that that brought about the big help out. And I really am grateful to all of those organisations for wanting to carry that programme on so we can really bring about a sustainable uh, volunteer network. I want to respond to some of the points that have been made, um, particularly around uh, the request for paid leave for volunteers and trustees. I do understand where people are coming from, but I think others have mentioned that there is a danger that could become a problem, particularly for the small and medium-sized businesses. But we do want to see employers develop their own uh, corporate responsibility programs uh, and to encourage businesses, the public sector and charities to consider the role that employer-supported volunteering can play as a part of their impact uh, on society. Uh, and we do, you know, we do try and encourage that and show best examples of how that actually benefits the business often. Um, others have asked for the reviewing and the uplifting of the approved mileage allowance payment. 
Under the scheme, organisations are able to reimburse volunteers for using their own vehicle while volunteering. They're able to agree what reasonable out-of-pocket expenses look like. However, for using their own vehicle, this is often worked out by using the HMRC mileage allowance payment rules, and Treasury is responsible for setting that which apply more broadly than just to volunteers. But I was pleased that the Government announced at the Spring Budget that we'll be keeping the 5p fuel duty cut, which I hope will help uh, in, in this area. Um, the, but more broadly, looking to the future, when we think about the vision for volunteering, as I mentioned earlier, my department is working in partnership with this. This is a strategic voluntary sector initiative to lead ongoing support and development of volunteering in England. That partnership is made up of DCMS, NCVO, NAVCA, Volunteering Matters, the Association of Volunteering Managers and Sport England. And I'm pleased to say that we've been able to provide £600,000 to fund this work. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how that develops. Others mentioned social prescribing. Uh, as part of our national physical uh, activity, uh, sorry, sport and physical activity um, um, strategy, we are working closely with colleagues in Department for Health because we see social prescribing as a way of getting people more active and volunteers will by the very nature be a big part of that but I know we'll continue uh, to work in that area uh, and of course as a department we lead cross-government volunteering policy and will continue to do so and the honourable gentleman mentioned philanthropy and he's absolutely right um, we, there's a lot we can learn and I'm pleased to say that as a department this is an area of focus. We see pockets of it looking really where it goes well in London and the South East but I want to see that much more broadly across the country and we'll continue to work uh, in that area. So this debate has demonstrated that we all share the same ambition. We want to celebrate volunteers and what they do and I'm grateful to the honourable members for highlighting that especially in the run up to the 40th anniversary of Volunteers Week so that we can celebrate and recognise the contribution of millions of people who dedicate their time and support in, uh, for their communities. Don't get him to wind up. Uh, thank you, Can I say it's been an absolute pleasure serving under your chairmanship. Um, I think we've had a very, very positive debate. Uh, we, we've all had the opportunity to praise uh, some of our local uh, charities and, and um, volunteers and, and organisations that work with volunteering. Um, as uh, the Honourable Lady for Bath said, volunteers come in all shapes and sizes. Um, I have to slightly disagree with um, the Honourable Member for Tiverton and Honiton um, about the, the, the mileage allowance because, I mean, for that very point that some people can afford to pay for their own petrol or diesel or whatever um, but if they can't there should be you know that shouldn't be a barrier to to people being able to volunteer when they want to um, i think we've covered a, a huge range of of topics and i don't want to, to delay people longer just to say that it's been enormously positive and um, i think that uh, to misquote dylan thomas um, uh, I don't plan to go gently into that good retirement. <laughs> so this is something that, that I will continue to, to fight for um, into, the, into the dusk. <laughs> but thank you very much for everybody who's taken part. Uh, and, and thank you for sharing. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered the contribution of volunteers. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary now, I think the ayes have it. Order, order, the sitting stands adjourned. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.